My name's Mark Powell and I'm label manager of Esoteric Recordings, which is a Cherry Red Records label. And on February the 5th uh, this year, Esoteric were pleased to um, release once again on CD the album McGough and McGear. Wow. And I'm pleased to say that with me is Mike McGear McCartney here today. Yes, this is me, Mark. Yes. How am I? Well, I don't know. You look very well. I'm great. <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> Mike, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And lovely to uh, chat again, Mark. And, um, well, really, what I'd like to talk about today is, is just everything to do with your life. Let's talk about everything. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Starting from when I was born. I, I, I don't remember coming out. <laughs> I've got to be honest here. I do not remember coming out. Well, we'll go a bit further ahead. Ooh, a little, bit, a little further, bit further, if ahead. you could, please. If I could, obviously... Uh, the McGough and McGear album came out of you and Roger McGough were members of the Scaffold. We were, who were originally called the Liverpool One Fat Lady Non-Electric Show, which no one could pronounce, so we became Scaffold. Uh, and we were doing scaffoldy things, uh, and we should really have gone and doing that. We're doing theatres and universities mainly, and so we should have stayed there. But it was one of those things that uh, we'd, uh, you know, we'd done the safe aspect of it. And so we thought, we had a few ideas, few songs, few poems, etc. And so uh, we said to John, look, we want to do this little experiment with these. We don't know where it's going to go. Uh, and, you know, what's going to happen, my God? We didn't realize what extraordinary the, the things that happened were totally unbelievable. It was uh, an explosion, a very gentle explosion, starting starting on the first day. <clears throat> my brother had said he would be, he was in a group, a rock and roll group, doing well in London at the time. And he'd made the mistake of admitting that he had taken LSD, pounds, shillings, and pence. Of course, yes. And uh, on this particular... I'll tell you when it was. It was his birthday, June the 18th. And so... But we're going to start this album. We don't know what it was called then. Uh, but we're just going to go to Dick James's music. Uh, he had a little studio, Dick James Music, who did all the Beatles publishing, and uh, sang Robin Hood, Robin Hood, with the band of men. Ever hear that on the telly again? That was Dick James yeah. singing. And so we're going to his recording studio. I said, the only little thing is, our kid, is, uh, by the way, for anyone listening for now, if I ever say our kid again, that means brother or sister in Liverpool slang, OK? So I said to our kid, the little problem is we're going from your house in London to Dick James's studio and the little problem is when we get in our car we have to go through that and point it out the window there is the whole entire world press waiting to get the drug addict waiting to to expose him we've got him and so our kids said let's oh, sort of, let's let's go it's my birthday let's go so got in his little aston martin db6 the gates open and there they were Brrr, got you, drug addict. And so we came to going out the gates, and our kid, and behind them were these children, all the fans, with it's his birthday, all the uh, flowers and chocolates, etc., pushing their way through the media. So our kid said, Wind down your window. So I wound down my uh, buzz, it wasn't those days, uh, and buzz, he, he wound down. And all this thing, like, oh, my God, we can't use it. Because all the children are living, kissing him and loving him, throwing flowers and, oh, voila. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the day. That was the start of the McGough McGear album. Uh, so that's the sort of insanity that it all started out with. Then went to uh, Dick James's studio. And all these wonderful people, like Zoop Money, uh, Spencer Davis, Graham Nash, uh, all these extraordinary John Mayle. You wouldn't believe it, or oh, just because they're mates. And uh, they just turned up, and we just like we do a little thing here, a little uh, track there, track here, etc. And it just slowly started to turn into a series of tracks. And then Roger 
adapted his poems with Andy Roberts. He was an important part of the musical. Our kid and Andy Roberts were the sort of, uh, our kid was the uh, producer uh, of the whole thing because you know, he knew he'd been working with his group and so he knew how to make things work and where everyone was and everyone respected him. So it was, right, go, we'll do this. Okay, that's it. And it just worked magically. It was like, and it was so loose. It was like, we just, the, the album, when you hear it, you may think, my God, that it's fresh, they say. Gee, it's very fresh. It's all in one take. <laughs> go. It does sound incredibly fresh and it's, oh. it's almost like a, a perfect, uh, time capsule of that period, I think. The, the, well, it, it's got a joyous spirit about it. Yes, life, it is. Yes. You know, you're absolutely right. It encompasses the, the freedom, the uh, satirical uh, anarchy that was going on. Uh, it was, uh, it does encapsulate that era. The 60s was a magic era. We'd come out of poverty and we had nothing to lose. Uh, uh, but we didn't like what was going on around us. We didn't like the political system. We didn't like Vietnam wars, etc. And it all came part of our little world, being uh, satirical comedians. Uh, we found it very easy. A little bit of heaven fell from out the sky one day. Tell the most terrible Irish accent in the world it was. It was terrible. But I would sing it along like this. And a little napa bomb is flying, you know, and the new explosion happening there and Phillips and the counting house counting out his money etc all that that will tell you who that was Jim Goddard uh, Thelma McGough uh, w was the uh, house uh, Jim Goddard the film uh, producer of Madonna's um, uh, Shanghai Surprise yes, yeah. and uh, 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 which he wasn't too proud of as uh, Sean Penn uh, and uh, then he did a wonderful uh, JFK series on the telly so he's lovely now he's with mum and dad up there and uh, he was the house etc on that track was he okay oh, yeah yeah well, that's the great thing of talking is as you talk you remember different things because now, do you want a, a now a little survivor? I wasn't going to tell you this, but I've got a little surprise for you. Yes. We're yes, talking please. McGough McGee, yes, right? Yes, please. I just happen to yeah. have in my little bag here, St. George's Hall bag here from Liverpool, St. George's Hall, Liverpool bag. I just happen to have, you're not going to believe it, this is the original McGough McGee album. <laughs> Look how battered it is. I'm sorry, there you go. That's it, show camera. And there's the back here. Where you can see here, you can see slowly what I did. It was in our kids' house in London where we saw uh, the media coming out. And uh, McGough and I uh, went to, a photographer came. And if you notice carefully here, I had a moustache when I started the session. And so, right, take that, thank you. Next one. Next one. Snap. <laughs> Till the whole moustache at the end, you will see him with no moustache at yes. all. So you see that going, no explanation, <laughs> no explanation. Hunter Davis did the uh, Margaret is now up there. But here, have a little look at the inside. First of all, I'll, I'll look at that. You look at that. Right. Uh, and I will read some of the people. That you look at that. They are the original acetates. Are the acetates. The white wow. labels. <laughs> Show them, look, what and all the so kids at home, what, what an acetate is. What is what is that on the label then? Yeah. You've got oh no, that's me mucking round. Ah, right. But here there are that's me saying the side one, side two, and they're just uh, oh, lovely daft things. But that's what you could do in those days. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll tell you all those, yeah. and I'll tell you the sort of music that was going on at that period. Leonard Cohen sings from a room, blood, sweat, and tears. Timmy Harding, one of my favourites, uh, Birds, Georgie Fame, Johnny Mathis, Peddlers, Bob Dylan, Nashville Skyline, uh, Simon and Garfunkel. That was all going on. Same label, yeah. same time. So that, <laughs> that's, fantastic that's the year. Yeah. No, it's great. I mean, so, and that's for that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, those are broken acetates on the floor there. there. Yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, shoot. <laughs> But with, with the album, I mean, it, it's become known as well for the fact that, as you say, such a, an amazing cast of musicians just appeared on it, notably they, Jimi Hendrix. They came, uh, but 
uh, and it was such a joy. Can you imagine uh, having a long, when you have, because Scaffold couldn't really sing. I was the only one that could sort of sing. And so you have in the studio uh, our kid who can sing rather well, and then you have uh, people like Graham Nash who turned up, and so you're doing harmonies with Graham Nash. And on Do You Remember, do, 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 do you remember? My brother and I are harmonizing for the first time we harmonized. We used to sing in Fourth Lynn Road. We had a little two up, two down house in Liverpool, which the National Trust have bought. Yes. And now it's a national institution. You go around with these headphones or in, in Japanese, in uh, German, in uh, Swaziland, whatever <laughs> the language is, uh, explaining what our little home was about. And so in Fourth Lynn Road, the two little boys, mm. the two little brothers, used to be the Everly brothers. Oh. Oh, right. Oh, okay. yeah. And so uh, we used to do these harms. Our family, uh, our little McCartney Mafia family, was very into harmonies at Christmases and things like that, New Year's Eve, etc. We'd always, Dad would be on the piano, people would put all the beer on for him, little half pints on the top, and, and Dad would just play the Joanna, all uh, tinkling the ivories, all evening. But the most important thing was the family would be singing, but, but you've got to get a better harmony than Uncle Joe. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and so we learned harmonies the hard way, because you gotta have to be good, and they're all listening, you get it wrong, Excuse me, you got to look. And so you had to be good. So we were the Everly brothers there. And so on Do You Remember of McGough McGear, it's uh, just our kid uh, on piano and me, and then he joins in harmonies. And that is lovely to hear mm. because it was the way it's the brothers uh, singing again, the way we used to as kids. So all that, and Graham Nash come in and put in his harmonies, his beautiful harmonies, his uh, middle and his high harmonies. So Nash, it's beautiful to hear on some of those tracks, so particularly ex art mm. student. Listen to ex art student. Nash, it's like, thank you very much. Nash just stands out. It's uh, absolutely extraordinary. So working with people like that. And then, the, as you said, what was funny was uh, our kid said one day, now we need a guitar on that so much in love. Uh, shall I ask Jimmy? So I said, Jimmy who? He said, uh, Jimi Hendrix. I said, sorry? The Jimi Hendrix. The madman, the, 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 the wild man of Borneo, Jimi <laughs> Hendrix. You joking? Yeah, he's in London. I can only ask him. I said, well, if you insist. <laughs> Jimi <laughs> Hendrix. OK, yeah, he'll turn up. And so the next day, uh, oh, Jimmy said he can do it. So we're in Delane Lee. We've moved from uh, Dick James's studio to Delane Lee studio, which was then in the same road as Ready, Steady, Go. The already steady go studios were down there, and, and Delaney Lee was here. And so we're working on a track in uh, the control room, and next thing the doorbell goes, and Dark Kid says, That'll be Jimmy. So I said, Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll get it. So I went out past the table. Now, all these people, uh, Graham Nash, John Mayle, Spencer Davis, uh, Jimmy Hendrix, these are superstars. And so. Um, you know what you you can't pay him, <laughs> not money like you know. So, but you can pay him in kind. And so I got this table full of ale, and so wine, beer those days, wine, uh, shorts, whatever they wanted, uh, it's on me. So they come. So that walk past that, get to the door, and knowing that Jimi Hendrix, if it really is him, is going to be there with his entourage of. A thousand groupies, manager, uh, photographer, uh, the media all surrounding him. And, you know, that's where I'm going to open the door. There's a little bloke. It's same wild stuff. The at and all the, <laughs> the thingy, the uh, military thingy there, and one guitar just standing there on his Todd. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, uh, uh, Jimmy? He says, uh, Mike? I said, yeah, yeah. I said, oh, hi, Mike. How are you? Uh, um, great, thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> this man, and this is why it's very, very important to always talk to people, all these things, these legends, these things that they put down in history, only ever take the words of the people that actually mm. met him, right? Mm. Jimmy Andrews, a gentleman, 
Yes. He was a yeah. he was such a lovely man, a lovely human being. So he comes in, he goes in, and I said, we're just doing a bit of mixing in, in the... He said, oh, that's cool. I get in, I'll just rehearse uh, in the studio. So he gets in there, sits down on the Delane Lee carpets with his guitar, practicing his stuff. Uh, so I go in and I said, Jim's sitting down on the thing. He's all mic'd up. They've mic'd him on the floor. And so our kid said, uh, OK, Jim, uh, should we send you the track? Yeah, go, cool, let's go. So it was in the control room, and the next is so much in love, da 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 so much in love, the great singer. <laughs> so and waiting for the coming up to the solo now. Ready? So it's a little little little. <laughs> what the bloody hell just happened? And our kid is like smiles there. <laughs> you got Hendrix, you got the, you got the whole, th and he's just done it. Automatically, I said, yeah, yeah. He said, what do you mean? He'd been working on Pepper, all control studio, studio times. You'd get it right, get it overdubbed, all these wonderful phasings, inventing all these wonderful things in music. And so it was great coming to suddenly to, to hear something free, <laughs> totally blah, 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 <laughs> out of there. So he said, I said, yeah, yeah. He said, what do you mean, yeah, yeah? I said, well, he didn't come in at the right place. <laughs> <laughs> he said, OK, do you want to tell Jimi Hendrix that he didn't come in the right place? I certainly will. <laughs> I certainly will. So I went out <laughs> into the studio. And he said, now, how was that, uh, Mike? I said, it was great, Jimmy. It was great, but it just didn't come in the right bit. He says, "Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, I just did. I'm just blew it. I just, I just went for it." I said, "Yeah, no." He said, "Can you tell me when to come in for the solo?" I said, "Be a pleasure, Jimmy Hendrix." <laughs> Sat down on the uh, carpeted floor of Delaney Lee Studios, <laughs> and then you're, you're Jimmy Hendrix now. Get your guitar ready. Go on. Uh, well, good boy. Go. Ready? Right. Actually, that uh, way around, because he was lefty. Oh, was he? Oh, yes, was he? Like yeah, that? He's, he's yeah. a lefty. OK, you ready, uh, Jimmy? Yeah. You ready? Don't <laughs> much. Yeah. No, no, no. Ready? Steady, Jimmy. You ready? You ready? Yeah. Ready? Steady? <laughs> now. <laughs> I, I kept on... Tapped him on the knee. Tapping him on the knee <laughs> till he got it right. I swear, several takes. And so that's it. Perfect. Yeah. He said, was that OK, Mike? And each one got more controlled, more in line, did exactly what I wanted, the one that's on. And so <laughs> I went back into the control room, and so our kids said, uh, OK, you happy now? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, let's hear it. So play it back, uh, technician, please, tape off. So we played it back, and it came in the right place, and it went out of the right place. Great. I said, ah, oh, I see. You mean that one that he first did? That is too controlled, it's a bit boring, isn't it? And so our kids said, oh, good, good. You had to learn the hard way. <laughs> so do you prefer the first one? Oh, my God, not off. What a difference. Doesn't matter where it comes in or where it goes. That was genius. Oh, good, you're right, Michael, well done. Tape up, can we have the first tape, please? The tape up says, what do you mean first? I've been wiping them all. <laughs> oh, You've only got so the last one. <laughs> So, so our kid, do you want to go out and tell Jimmy that? I said, no, it's OK. <laughs> I mean, it is so, I mean, you can hear him as you say all oh. over that. But it's the so. lovely thing, you hear the record now, and then he does it right, but then we leave him, and then he's, free, he's back free again. Mm. And then he's, I'm singing away, and then he comes in, and he does it over, and it, magic in weaving in between the song. Uh, the real Jimi Hendrix is on there just a little later. And at the end, the end track of the album called Ex Art Student, my God. You could listen to that, you could put a loop tape on that end bit, just on the end bit, where it goes from this Ex Art Student, Ex Art Student. And in fact, we did the trick we did on Leave It uh, on the Bagheera album. On that end fade, we're at ex art student, ex art student, ex art student, ex art student, ex art student. <laughs> right? We did the same trick on uh, leave it on a cha 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 cha. Leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it, and leave it. 
Cha-chang, <laughs> cha. The DJs in America with all, hey, well, that was Mike McGill. Oh, my God, what has he done? Those bar stools. Yeah. Uh, so we did the same trick, but then the end of when uh, it then starts floating, uh, Jimmy starts, uh, Dave Mason is on sitar, uh, Wib Bennett, William uh, Wib Bennett from the Royal Liverpool, no, the Royal London Philharmonic Orchestra is on flute. And those three take you into another dimension. It's fantastic. It yeah. is <laughs> so beautiful. You can just hear it and, and then just close your eyes and this beautiful sitar music giving you that beautiful feel and whips floating over, over like this and then and Jimmy's in and wah, 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 wah. <laughs> It is. Oh, I could listen. Honestly, that was such a... I haven't heard it for so many years. But then to hear that, and hearing some of the tracks on the album, it's such a joy of that. I'd forgotten how good some of yeah. them were. And it's one of those records as well. I mean, at the time, and as, as you said, I think it got well-received critically. M.M. Um, um, uh, sorry, Melody Maker, M.M. <laughs> album of the Month. <laughs> uh, you got the album of the month. Didn't sell because, uh, you know, it was so different. <clears throat> You've got a record, so, uh, so much in love, and then uh, live in a bass from flat for duper 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 And right in the middle of it, it stops. And Rog comes on and does his poem <laughs> with Andy <laughs> Roberts. Oh, OK. And then it starts again. And it, uh, so commercially, it's not commercially viable. But now, today, of course, cycles go around. Of course, all the people that uh, were in that world, Peely and all those people, they loved it mm. because it was different. And that's why all those musos came along, because we were different. We were comedians, satirical comedians, poets. We weren't a threat. And so that's why they found it very easy. Jimi Hendrix, you know, he's not going to go to a Rolling Stone track or a Beatle track. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, hold on, it's too, too much of a problem, you know. But to, to me, to us, he can uh, enjoy himself, and, all of them. And of course, after shortly after that album came out, you know, you were big pop stars again with uh, a, for, no, a for, no, not again, for the first time. Oh, it was the first time, This is it? the first right. time we'd never been big at all. Uh, so we, and in fact, we had done, I don't know when it was, we'd started off, but certainly not but on top of the pops, pop stars, we'd started off with the first record, and strangely, I don't know why EMI uh, gave us Sactors, because this uh, pop song that we chose to do, being a, a Scouse comedy group, right, we were from Liverpool, for the first time in our lives, in the first time in Liverpool's lives, the Liverpool accent, the Scouse accent, was accepted down here in London, right? And that was extraordinary, because anywhere London controlled, anywhere north of the war, Wash. Anywhere north of Watford was hinterland jungle. <laughs> they, it was non-existent. It just didn't. They didn't bother talking to you. They found out you're from Liverpool. They, you go to a party and they hello, hello, how are you, uh, Peregrine, uh, Celia? <laughs> these are chaps. Where are you from? <laughs> uh, we're from Liverpool. Anyway, Peregrine and Celia, yeah. they would literally because really? you know, yeah, yeah, really, and they would uh, turn away because you're no use to them totally useless and so but then suddenly <coughs> uh, the um, Mersey beat came down and suddenly it's on everywhere on all the radios you go to the same party the next week and there uh, is oh hello chaps how are you uh, I'm Peregrine this is uh, Cecilia where are you chaps from uh, from Liverpool oh jolly good oh Liverpool oh jolly, come Cecilia uh, <laughs> Peregrine come over these chaps are from Liverpool and they'd start doing a Liverpool accent and it always came out Birmingham <laughs> All right, dear, whack. Oh, oh, great. But we were accepted for the first mm. time, so uh, it was quite a, a thing. Right, I've gone off on my... Your job, Mark, is to bring me back into... Bring you back to what we were talking people's about. lives. Which was, I think you were just to go uh, about to um, tell me about thank you very much and 
becoming pop stars. It was indeed. We were before that. Uh, it was. Can you, so can you imagine being uh, for the first time in our lives allowed to be Liverpudlians, Scousers, and now we're proud Scousers down in London. Guess what our first record was? A Cockney dirge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were Saturdays, for God's sake. And so our first record <coughs> coming on all the She loves you, yeah, 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 yeah. How do you do? What did all the pop songs of the day? <laughs> Freddy Dream of dancing round everyone. Oh, yeah, lovely, lovely, lovely. Our first record, and here it goes on Tupac Stewart, there, there. To die's man die. <laughs> to die's man die. Man dies, washing dies, everybody happy. You bet your life we are. <laughs> that was our first hit miss record. <laughs> <laughs> so it got nowhere. It, actually, on your box jury, I might have a tape of that somewhere, mm. one of the tapes that I've been finding recently, with Spike Milligan uh, on it saying, if, this, if there was a, a, a comedy uh, jukebox jury, this would be number one. <laughs> <laughs> but I voted a miss, obviously. It's yes, not quite yeah. the thing. And then we did something we told by. Sorry, we were with our kids' agency called NEMS. Yeah. And so I told Brian Epstein, who was the boss, I said, this thing called Batman is on the children's television. It's called Greg. We've done a little spoof called Good Bat Nightman. It, it's cool. It's lovely. But get it out now. Oh, yes, jolly good, Michael. Uh, Brian used to talk like this. He said, jolly good, Michael. Yes, we'll get round to it. No, no, got to do it now, Brian. Really, it's, oh, the kids are one. It's really, by the time he got it out, the kids have gone off the telly. Yes. So yeah. Everyone's forgot about it. Lovely little song. Uh, died again so strangely i don't understand why but um emi parlophone sacked us <laughs> don't know why because we're not selling and so they had given this thing and so we got a bit uh not particularly enamored with them so we changed to we thought somewhere that's going to be better for scaffold and that was david frost agency david frost the reason we got into show business was that was the week that was and David Frost. So we went to his agency called Noel Gay, and so we changed sides. And uh, he said, "Have you got what? what have you got?" We said, "Oh, all the theatre stuff, the university stuff. That's what we do. That's what we're best at. That's why we've come to you." I said, "But I've just, we just recorded this song to thank everyone for coming to the theatres. Called Thank You Very Much. I wrote a song called Thank You Very Much, uh, and it, it's in Abbey Road. Uh, we did it in Abbey Road." And so, you know, we should get that. He said, oh, yeah, okay. So he uh, contacted EMI and said, right, uh, have you sacked Scaffold? We've got a letter here from you saying, the crap, the, they don't sell records. <laughs> Not quite that language yes. from Sir Joseph Locke. Uh, but it was, uh, sorry, bye-bye, boys, uh, you don't sell. Uh, so we got the letter, and he said, yes, yes, we don't want them. Uh, so they said, right, okay, so you have this, they've got a record that they record called, thank you very much, have, have, is that what? Don't know about that. So we're just going to offer that to someone else. Is that OK? Uh, well, hold on. You know, uh, we'll listen to it first. So they listened to it and immediately came back and said, uh, yeah, we want it. He said, do you now? You've just sacked them. We'll, we, we will uh, let you have it at very different. And so a new contract was signed right. to our uh, advantage. Yes. Uh, and so we gave it to him, and we let it go out, and, and that was our first hit. Were you then on stage with uh, Rolling Stones, Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> <laughs> on podiums in Top of the Pops, it was called. Very strange. <laughs> and, of course, that single, as, as, as you said, you know, became the, the favourite record of the Prime Minister then, Harold Wilson. How I knew it would, how, how I was told it was a hit was by Paul Samuel Smith, who was also on the McGuff McGear, another important part of McGuff McGear album. Oh, God, is, the, is they coming to take me away? Give in, <laughs> give in. 
Uh, and Paul Samuel Smith, I used to stay with him sometimes in Liverpool. You need a place down here. I used to stay with Paul sometimes. And uh, so he rang me one morning. Uh, sorry, Paul Samuel Smith from the Yardbirds, the, yeah. the bass player from the Yardbirds, then a great producer of <laughs> Cat Stevens and Carly Simons. I'm sorry about the Cat Stevens thing. I was walking through, uh, Paul had told me he's working with this uh, lad called Cat Stevens. And uh, he, he said, we're just doing this album, fresh album, we just completed it actually. And so uh, strangely, I was walking through Seoul the next day and there is Cat Stevens walking through Seoul with these boxes. Obviously, they're the 16 track tapes, master tapes, of his new T for the Tillema, whatever it's called, album. And so he's holding him like his baby, you know. And he, of course, nobody knows him. And so, that, so I said, uh, all right, cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, 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 please, please don't mug me. Take, take anything, take all my money. Don't take these, my baby, please. And I said, uh, oh, Mike. <laughs> uh, so that's where Paul Samuel went on to produce uh, Carly Simon, great producer, immaculate ears. So he rang me. This is when I first knew about Tar. He said, uh, "Hey, Mike, you got a hit." I said, "What?" He said, "Thank you very much. It's a hit." I said, "Hold on, it's only just been released. Uh, it was on in the charts. How do you mean it's, a it's simple? The milkman came with me milk this morning, went back down the, the uh, path, going." <laughs> <laughs> you got a hit. And that's when you got a hit, yeah. And that, you suddenly realise, mm. when you're famous, you go, come down into London and uh, the taxi drivers uh, recognise you. You suddenly realise, my God, we're famous. <laughs> a taxi, London taxi driver knows who we are. So uh, that was the first thing. And you're right, it was... Uh, we found out. <laughs> I've been telling people for years that it was Harry Wilson's, Harold Wilson, <laughs> Prime Minister of Great Britain's favourite record. I've been telling people that this for years, because I and I've got a cutting now uh, of it saying in Sheffield, uh, Harold Wilson was asked for a choice and he chose. Thank you very much. But I just remembered it from somewhere, probably that cutting, and so. Um, I just remembered it, and I'd got away with this for years, telling people, they'd say, you know, with a thank you very much record. I said, you know, that was Prime Minister uh, of Great Britain's favourite record, you know. And Radio 4 once rang me and said, oh, Mr McCartan, we've uh, asked, we've been asked about this Aintree Iron. Would you like to comment on, on your thank you very much sign? I said, yeah, thank you very much, Aintree Iron uh, was uh, Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain, Harold Wilson's favourite record. And he said, uh, yes, we know. I said, oh, do you? How do you know? He said, we asked him. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I said, how did it go? He said, oh, it was interesting, really. We rang him up and uh, uh, said, uh, uh, Mr. Wilson, this is uh, um, Radio 4 here, Lord Wilson. I think he said Sir, Sir Wilson or something like that. Lord Wilson. He was reminded of me, Lord Wilson. Do you think you're talking to? And uh, he said, oh, I'm sorry, Lord Wilson, uh, but we have this inquiry <laughs> from Radio 4 listeners about this entry, uh, this thank you very much scaffold, thank you very much to the entry iron thing, and just asking what is the entry iron? Would you happen to know? Is that true? Was that? Yeah, uh, yes, I used to like that record. Uh, I don't know about entry iron. Oh, hold on a second, I'll ask Mary. So his wife is over the other side of the room. This is all that this guy is telling me. This. He said, Mary. You said yes, dear. He said uh, there's a, a, a bloke on from Radio Four Business and asking about the ancient iron. You know something about that, don't you? And uh, you know what the ancient iron is, don't you? A little voice floated over from the other side of the room. I think it's a bit of fun, Harold. <laughs> <laughs> Got it in one, Mary. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then later, I am in the Castle of May been commissioned to take photographs now. I'm now a photographer, mm. could you believe? <laughs> and, uh, I am now being commissioned by uh, the Scottish Enterprises uh, of tourist uh, government body to do a photograph at the top of Scotland, the North Highlands of Scotland. So we've been to all these places and we're going to the Castle of May. 
and this wonderful place that apparently the Queen Mother was going past one day uh, on this main road and said, what's that down there? And they said, oh, Castle of May, Ma'am, it, it's uh, out of commission, it, it's dying, you know. She said, oh, how charming, it was a lovely place. Let's have a look. So we went in, looked down, and it, you know, t totally ruined. She said, yes, let's tear this up. Right. <laughs> in, in Her Majesty's <laughs> words, let's tear this up, like, you know. And so <laughs> they did, they charted it up. And so now it's a beautiful place that uh, Charles goes to every year at a certain time of the year. Uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie goes there for his little bit where the tourists aren't allowed. And then the tourist season started because it's very special to him because of he was brought up there uh, as a baby uh, and a young man, etc. And his mum, etc. And her sister. It's all a big part of their lives. And so we're in Castle of May <coughs> and the, it's controlled by the majors these beautiful ex-army gentlemen uh, and they are first thing uh, i've said I, I come in would you like some uh, michael how nice to i'm uh, johnny is there major johnny he was a uh, uh, major johnny i said hello major johnny how are you would you like some sandwich and a little tiffin and a little cup of tea i said lovely yeah bless you that's great so he brings the the, the grub and the tea and so we're just uh, getting in. He says, by the way, Michael, I've got to tell you, uh, your thank you very much for the Aintree Iron. I said, right. Shook his hand. He said, what was that for? I said, you remembered it was called thank you very much for the Aintree Iron. Yes. Oh, good, good. No, no. But I must tell you that the most important part of that, it was Her Majesty the Queen Mother's favourite record. Do you know <laughs> that? I said, go away with you. Get on. He said, no, no, really. I, well, I will take you up. And he did to the dining room and they'd have uh, their dinner and at the end of it they'd have single on the royal family and mum would do it and our two little daughters Elizabeth and Margaret all singing along uh, etc uh, and uh, they got and they would start this thing because Major obviously Major John was obviously there then and they would start the song thank you very much and at one juncture in your song uh, the Queen Mother insisted on taking uh, over. I said, oh, I watch it. Oh, he said, he said, thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very much. Cease. And she would say, for a gracious queen. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very much. Cease. For a gracious queen. <laughs> thank you very, 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 very much. And so, uh, but at the time, uh, they were so nice and so low. I didn't have the heart to tell them. The actual lyrics are, thank you very much for our gracious team. Liverpool right, FC. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I did the book, uh, Mike McCartney's North Highlands, I think it's called, and I sent it to him with the story in it. <laughs> so his problem, sorry, uh, Major Johnny. Yes. Well. Major Johnny to sound <laughs> control. And then, of course, you had Liddy the Pink after that as well, which was... Liddy the Pink, uh, that Number was... One. We did one between, thank you very much, mm. and uh, in fact, the one we did between, thank you very much, and Lily the Pink was Do You Remember? Mm. The song on McGough McGear. That's the original track, uh, Our Kid and I, uh, which is magic. So we decided to redo it. I just wanted to use that track just put that and we put the no it's not allowed here my have to do it. you have to redo it session musicians etc scaffold didn't play didn't play instruments so we had to have the best session musicians and i will tell you one of the session musicians on lily the pink in a minute you could honestly you couldn't make any of this or could you uh but it was uh in between we did this do you remember went into abbey road uh, re-recorded re it and it was actually uh, one of Twiggy's favourites because she loved the bit in the middle uh, of Gorman doing a shoe, soft shoe shuffle. The idea of being on a radio and having a soft shoe shuffle <laughs> on a radio, <laughs> she, she loved that bit. Uh, and it went out and uh, thingy, Peter Asher, uh, uh, Peter and Gordon, uh, he said to me, uh, you know, because it didn't sell. It, it was, it, we were on every telly, it, it, uh, every Morecambe and Wise show, everything on telly, uh, because we'd had, mm. thank you very much, to say it. So they all wanted us. And uh, Pete once said, that was a, a number one, in, that was a, a major hit in every way 
but sales. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yes. And so the yeah. end, the end, so the end thing. We had this thing called uh, Lily the Pink. We were talking about uh, how Lily the Pink was a really bawdy and. That's where Lovely it song. started out. It mm. was a song that we used to sing uh, between our university and theatre shows in the pub afterwards. That was, yeah, zing, ka, zing, ka, zing, with disgusting words. <laughs> Those were. So, but the song was good. And so we thought that would be a good commercial one. We've done, thank you very much, a nice, uh, happy little sing-along uh, uh, success from four or something, a five, a five, I think got a four in the chart. Do you remember? OK, we didn't quite get that right, uh, with lower charts. Uh, so we've got this one. It's commercial, but obviously we can't give uh, disgusting lyrics, so uh, we will do it with much simpler, childlike lyrics, uh, and so and the structure of the song. And they said, "You'll never get away with that." We said, "How do you mean? You can't have a song a drink a drink a drink drink a drink a drink to up to heaven her soul is it stops you can't have a song like that that'll never get to number one okay and so uh so the first thing is we went redid all the verses got them uh, uh john uh, mike verse john verse roger verse da, 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 all had equal verses and one of the magic ones on this uh the verses was uh, if you ever hear Lily the Pink on any radio, the number one Lily the Pink, you ever hear it, listen again to the Jennifer Eccles verse. Because at that time, the Hollies, Hollies were number one with Jennifer Eccles. And so Rain Graham Nash and said, hey, Gray, uh, we're doing this daft song in Abbey Road. And uh, one verse is taking the uh, mickey out of uh, Jennifer Eccles. Uh, can you come and sing it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll do that. Great. Fantastic. Because uh, what you do when you do hit songs, etc., you always think, you know, I can do better. You know, you always think, that's just a hit song. And so, yeah, I'll come. <laughs> and so whenever you listen to it, you listen to it. Uh, and now, from now on, it is so... Everyone thinks it's Roger McGough. It is so Graham Nash, that verse. It is, Low, yes. lower red. It, It's stinking. <laughs> it's obviously it him. is obviously yeah. Graham, yeah. etc. Uh, so that was the word. So we adjusted all that, did the bit where she dies and goes to heaven, etc. Uh, so that's all structured, right? Norrie Paramore was the uh, producer. Uh, so we got into Abbey Road, etc. Now we're going to record it. And Mike Vickers from Manfred Man was in charge of all the musos. As I say, we couldn't play, so we needed the top session men. So get into, I'll tell you where it was, number one studio, the big one. All you need is Love Studio. It's a great big one. Uh, then two, we did the majority of the, with the stirs. And then three, uh, you could never get in there because Pink Floyd was always in there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so we get there, ready to record this Lily of the Pink song. And so uh, there, we're looking through the window. And I said to Mike Vickers, what the hell is he doing out there? Oh, he's just uh, wa wanted to, to do a session. He, you know, the money comes, session money is good. And so I said, I don't, can I go and have a word with him? So I walk out to Jack Bruce <laughs> from Cream, <laughs> who was sitting on with his bass in the middle of all the musos. And I went to, oh, hello, Mike, how are you? I said, hello, Jack, nice to see you. Oh, great, great to see you, Mike. I said, uh, the, uh, and it's all, the, all the session men are tuning up and getting ready. So I whispered into uh, Jack Bruce from Cream's ear. I said, Jack, you know, anything you want to do on this song, do it. <laughs> it's okay. He says, hey, Mike, I've been looking at the dots here. And to tell you the truth, um, you know, I think the best thing for this song is boom, 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 <laughs> boom, 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 <laughs> we'll think it, boom, 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 boom. And that's exactly what he did yes, yeah. uh, on the thing. So uh, that was it. Graham Nash was on the verse there. There is a wonderful Je Je Jennifer Eccles, Graham Nash singing. Jennifer Eccles, a terrible freckles, and the boys all called her na 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 na. One of the uh, most memorable, lovely memories that uh, was said to me was a gentleman called Tim Rice. Ever heard of Tim mm, Rice? Yes. He's done rather <laughs> yeah. well in the yes, show yeah. business world. He was the can lad. He was the coffee boy on Lily the Pink, right? <laughs> 
I think he called himself co-producer or something, right? We know your tricks. <laughs> a lovely man, still always was, uh, always will be a lovely man. And so um, he once said these immortal lines that, na, 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 na. He says, Michael, don't you ever forget I was a na, 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 na. <laughs> Because we got all these people to go, yes. and, and yeah. I'll tell you another one was Elton John, who, when he, he was, was Reg Dwight. Was we met him. In, we well, met him in yeah. Dick James's studio. No, yes. he used to go to. Uh, this is I found out. I'd forgotten. Uh, I'd found out when I went to the launch of our kids' wings in London. And everybody is uh, there. Now, there is Gilbert O'Sullivan in his cap, just making a comeback. Good on you, Gilbert. And walk past him, go to the bogs, and they're uh, launching uh, wings here. Go in the bogs, having a wee, and this young lad uh, joins. And uh, hello, Mike. Uh, hello. Oh, hello, Reg. He said, oh, no, no, I'm not Reg now. I've just changed my name. Oh, have you, son? I just know you from Dick James. It's, no, I've changed my name. What to? It's the, to Elton John. I said, oh, yes, yeah, I saw a bit in the paper. Oh, good luck, Reg. I mean, Elt, good luck, son. Well done. He said, oh, they were great days, though. I said, yeah. <laughs> what were the Abbey Road? They were great days. I said, what? You, sorry, what do you mean? It was scaffold, you know. I said, keep going. I don't know what you're talking about. We used to come, my mate and I, Charlie, whatever his mate was, we used to come to Abbey Road and do your backing sessions. We used to sing with you. It was you I did sing. I said, I remember two lads coming, helping me with the harmonies. So that was us. And when you listen to any scaffold yeah. records, like <laughs> Graham now, you listen to them and you will hear Elton John. Elton John. You know, honestly, it's, it's so obvious. These people are very obvious when you, when you know, <laughs> when you give them the uh, thingy. And he said, they were our best sessions, those. We used to come, and when we got in the session, men, uh, and we'd do all day, all we'd do was laugh all day, and at the end, get paid. <laughs> he said, that was the be best gigs. Yours were the best gigs we ever did. So that that's mm. the... Uh, uh, the sort of people that uh, came along. Uh, and so now 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 there was Tim. Uh, so all these things were on that Lily the Pink, the Pink, the Pink, uh, which was big, number one. And of course, a few years later, you then, in 1970, 71, embarked on uh, your first solo Drugs. album. Liquid Drugs. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? Your first solo album, Woman, mm. which mm. Uh, was a... Uh, a departure. Uh, it was a total that. departure. It was, uh, in the end, uh, one of uh, Keith Moon's favourite records. And uh, it was one of those things where I'd been doing all scaffold st safe stuff. And I did a few things in the act that were different to scaffold. So I thought, if I could continue that, if anybody had joined me, I will try it up north in Strawberry Studios. And so where 10CC did all their stuff. And so I uh, rang them and said, yeah, yeah, you come and give special rates. Thank you. Thank you, 10CC. And uh, rang the lads, Zoop Money, uh, Dave on bass, John Meginson, uh, all these wonderful Norm Yard Dog on Gob Iron, all these beautiful people. Uh, and they came and stayed. Uh, I think Neil Innes might have had something to do with it, uh, whatever. But all these beautiful people came from the south, came and put some of them up in our house, and then we'd go to Strawberry Studios every day, and I'd have all these songs that I was, had worked on, uh, and we, they would slowly come out in the studio, very different to what I'd ever done before. Woman was a, a very different album. Uh, but it's something I wanted to do. Uh, and as I say, uh, at the end, people like Mooney loved it because it was just me and Musos, and, uh, but a total departure from Scaffold. So I came down, uh, we'd finished all the album. Actually, went from Strawberry, did some overdubbing in Abbey Road, okay. come to think of it. Uh, I remember Roger Bunn, more 
what was it called? More, uh, not temperature, moderation, no, no, something. And oh, some, some term that he wanted. And Ginger Johnson's African drums. Oh, absolute magic. They came to the studio out of their skulls floating. Ginger <laughs> Johnson, his, his African drum. They were beautiful, they were just floating. They, they were all the, the drums on That's the end right, yes, of yes. one of the tracks, and they were great. They just like they came in a big white van. And we, they were about an hour late, and I'm thinking, <laughs> what the hell is going on? And the next thing, I could see this white van trying to get into Abbey Road, and it was sort of touching the, the gateposts. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down and said, excuse me, lad, you can get over there. Like, <laughs> up, came in, etc. Just floating. <laughs> Beautiful. Open the door. Whoa! <laughs> that's interesting. And they came in. Oh, great stuff. Oh, that's absolute magic stuff. And so did all that. So all these beautiful uh, people, uh, Brian Auger uh, on his uh, beautiful organ, all these wonderful people. Uh, all, and so there it is, the finished woman album, uh, I thought, for the uh, cover. Uh, well, no, I, before that, it was now just the album, S just the, I think I'd had acetates, white labels done, whatever, and so I brought it down to, was it Ron White, whoever was the head of EMI Parlophone then that had done Scaffold, uh, because it was after, thank you very much, mm. and after uh, Lily the Pink, uh, and before uh, Liverpool Lou. So, uh, but we'd had these hits with uh, uh, AMI, so AMI was talking to us, and we were good because we sell produce, you know, we sell points, and so that was great. So big unveiling in the offices of AMI, I think Manchester Square, there, there it goes on, and there's, and I am like just listening to it, and, I, and I'm watching everybody's like, you know, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm, very good. They listened to the whole thing. I made them bloody listen to the whole thing. And, like, you know, at the end, yeah, okay. And so that was so, you know, Lily the Pink, thank you very much for the entry. I do, 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 that's all they knew. So I'm in all this stuff. Wish, you know, I watched it, la, 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 jolly good show. I want you to know all this. They were all, uh, diddly, diddly, Danny Baker's favourite, etc. coming on was not exactly what they expected. <laughs> so that was it. <clears throat> As we walked down the corridor, the boss of EMI said, I said, what do you think? I think Ron. I said, what do you think, Ron? He said, very good, Mike, very good. Uh, but when are you going to give me another Lily of the Pink? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> ah, OK, you don't get it. And so that was it. I, uh, I, I said, sorry, honestly, this, you, you're no good for it. You, even if you released it, you would destroy it because mm. you don't understand it. And so I rang round a few companies, and uh, Ireland were the ones that were... Uh, m you know, most interested. So they they listened to it. Yeah, love it. Yeah, we'll we'll go with this. So rang EMI. Uh, and they said how much? How much is it going to cost? So I said uh, okay. Um, so let me just ask EMI first. So I rang EMI and said uh, how can you? Do, oh, we'll get the accountants on that. And they rang back. Oh, it'll cost how we'll call it. Ten thousand pounds. Can't remember what it was. Uh, yes, your album cost ten thousand pounds. I said, okay, oh great. Just wondering. That's all. Thanks a lot. Put the phone down. Rang Ireland. It'll cost you ten thousand pounds. Said, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll go for that. So rang EMI back. Okay, uh, 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 thanks. We'll, uh, Ireland are going to pay. What do you mean Ireland are going to pay? Uh, we're buying it. Uh, Ten thousand pounds in. Oh, what, you mean another record company? What's wrong with? Uh, sorry, you don't understand it. Uh, it. I've got to go with somebody that understands it. Oh well, you know they were. Oh, uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, uh, mate, they're not my trade. Uh, uh, so excuse me. Back for the accountants. This is for a record company. Oh, uh, excuse me. We're giving you uh, mate rates. In, in, uh. And so they came back. Something like. 15,000. So, right, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's how much it's going to cost you now. So I thought, oh, Jesus, I'll have to go with the MI. So I rang uh, Ireland back, said, sorry, they just upped it to something like 15. To 15. And they said, uh, hold on, hold on, we'll get back to you. Yeah, we'll go, we'll go with that. And so 
That's how they had faith, and they paid over the odds. And that was a very proud album of mine. It is a terrific record, and of course, um, the title track has been used on television recently. It was. Danny Baker, I did his radio show the other day, and he gets up the woman album from his archives uh, that he's had this thing he's because he Danny Baker is a big record collector record he loves uh, songs and more oblique song the better for him he's a real record expert and a buff and so he gets up my original album of woman uh, and I said oh uh, great uh, nice to see you got my mum there he says what do you mean I said that's my mum on the front this nun here, is it your mother? I said, yeah, it's me. everyone thinks it's a nun, but it's, she's a nurse, my yes, mum. Yes. That's my mum. He says, I've had this album for 20, 30, 40 years. I never knew that was your mother. <laughs> so, well, you made my day. <laughs> so that was it. That's me mum on it. And I notice on the back, there's a little uh, Roger Bear. In, yes. in in the back there, I did a children's book called Roger Ver, and uh, uh, I notice uh, for no reason nobody will know what it's about at all. He's just sticking up in the leaves for no reason uh, uh, on the back. On the back cover, yeah. And that was when the times. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is why it's interesting talking because I go off on tangents, as you have well realised. As unfortunately, we all realise by now. <laughs> At one stage, uh, Brian Epstein, I think he was coming back from our day's night premiere down in London on the plane, and Brian said, uh, Michael, if you, uh, sorry, Brian Epstein, said, if you'd like to ever become a, a pop singer, uh, then it'd be my pleasure to uh, do that. If you ever, I said, no, Brian, no, no, that's our kids' thing. He, He's rather good at this <laughs> pop business. I'm doing it with scaffold comedy, it's satirical comedy. Uh, that's where I want to be. Then, well, if you ever change your mind, Michael, uh, I, I'm, I'm your man. I said, OK, thanks, Bri. No. And so years later, I, I remember those words and thought, yeah, I could have to maybe after the woman. And so I thought, uh, but obviously not happy. Uh, so who would be good to be my manager? Who could make me a star? Bowie's manager, Tony Visconti. He's yes. the man for me. <laughs> you couldn't make this <laughs> up, could you, Mark? I swear, I went to Tony Visconti, had a few tracks, and said, uh, Tony, I was thinking of going into the business. I like what you did with Dave. Uh, do you want to listen to these? He said, OK, Mike, great. And uh, and by the way, I've just done, done this children's book called Roger Bear. Uh, Dave's just had a baby. Uh, can you give that to him for his baby? <laughs> I said, I certainly will. Yeah. I, I, I said, uh, and I signed it to Dave, a new baby. Uh, gave it to him. And so that was it. And I'm just waiting mainly for the call back, saying, I heard your tapes. You are a genius. You are Elvis. <laughs> Look, move over. Excuse me, Beatles, Rolling Stones. Excuse me, Bowie. Get out. <laughs> this is the boy, Mike McFab. Mm. And the call never came, <laughs> strangely. And so uh, I, I eventually had to ring him. <laughs> And uh, he, didn't, he, had to, he didn't return the calls. I had to trick him to get him. So eventually I tricked him and said, oh, Tony, uh, Mike McGeary. Oh, yes, Mike, yes, yes. i been meaning to call you. Yeah, I bet you have. So what about the tapes? He said, yes, Mike, yes, uh, yeah, uh, they're fine, yes. The tape, not what, I'm a bit busy with David at the moment. Uh, he didn't say, you know, the crap or not what we're looking for. <laughs> bit busy with him, gentlemen. He said, a bit busy with uh, David at the moment. Uh, but may I tell you, David loved your children's book. <laughs> <laughs> he loved Roger, he loved Roger Bear. Sod off. <laughs> You're not a pop singer. <laughs> but of course, you did do a, a, another album after that. You did the uh, McGear album. I did. That was, I think, something like 74. 74. I think 74. Yes. Again, that just came about the ups and downs of show business. I have had the roller coaster of a career, up and down all the time. And one of the uh, down times, wasn't doing anything. Our kid said, uh, what are you doing? I said, uh, nothing, scaffolds uh, sort of finished now. And uh, oh, finishing, I can't remember when they finished. 
I remember when they finished the All, uh, All Fools show, uh, April Fools show at the Albert Hall is when we finished our last official gig. Uh, but we wasn't doing anything. So uh, what about music? Doing any music? I said, oh, I've written uh, a few tracks. He said, oh, should we uh, try them? Let's come down and see what happens. I said, OK, great. So I went down and we started working in his house on this track uh, called Leave It. So, right, went like that, oh yeah, and so throwing in words, and, and here's the cha chang 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 cha chang 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 And uh, oh, I like that, so, so do I, uh, it's a good track, that. Uh, and so, let's record it. I said, oh, okay, and of course he could. Yes. He, could he could go to Abbey Road and pay for it, you know. <laughs> it was a magic bit once, this wasn't with him, uh, in Abbey Road, when I went back to number two studios upstairs, and they just changed it from that room, and they changed it round, and there was a new uh, clock on it. Only this time, I am paying for the thing. Leave it, our kid paid, and whatever, uh, Apple or whatever is, MPL, whoever was in charge of that. But later on, I, I did something that I had to pay for, and so, uh, and of course, uh, EMI rates, Abbey Road, are not cheap. <laughs> and so, but I had to do it there, and so, uh, I'm doing this track with da, 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 da. and there's this new digital clock and it's just ticking away don't you know uh, 3 uh, 42 43 44 45 and I'm f thinking 45 pounds 46 pounds 46. <laughs> <laughs> oh god and so done it all etc and as I'm walking out I said uh, I said that clock uh, you know my, people might think you could misconstrue that and think it might be that it might be money instead of seconds. Oh, okay. The next time I came, it had gone. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so what I do for the music business? Yes. <laughs> so, 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 hey, Mr. EMI. I hope you hear that story, Mr. Abbey Road. <laughs> so McGee did actually bring you some some attention again, really, uh, when, when it came. Yeah, out. it was good. It started off mm. with. Uh, the Leave It single, which we then needed a B-side for, which we did in our house uh, called Sweet Baby. It was called uh, Oh My Lovin', Oh My Lovin', How Can I Give You All oh My Lovin'? Lovely little track. Uh, with It was our kid on piano. It was in my den in, in our house up north. And... Uh, and Linda had... I had this fan, Japanese fan, and it was one of those you, you cool down. But the surface was like a drum surface. So when you uh, dominated, doom, doom, doom. So, uh, so that's, you, when you hear the record, <laughs> it goes, dilum, dun, 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 our kid on guitar, dilum, dun, 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 dilum, dun, 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 boom, boom. Boom, Lynn going boom, boom, boom all the way through. Oh, my loving, oh, my loving, la, la, la. So that was the B-side. And I've just done uh, on Facebook, um, uh, Pete did some new stuff and said about the McGear album and all these people, and a lot of people, what about Sweet Baby? That we should put that on, etc. And that was just done in the den. Uh, again, a bit like the McGough McGear in terms of the innocence and the whatever's round, let's go for it. Like the interview we're doing now, you just go for it. You don't think about it. Yeah. You just do it. And so that was the B-side. And so uh, our kid was with, was with uh, Linda then. And uh, so we sent it to New York. And Lee, her dad then, was alive. And John, uh, uh, brother, uh, listened to this thing and said, what the hell are you doing? This is a big single, this. What are you, he's leaving it there. Why don't you do an album? And so our kid said, they've just said to New York about an album. Uh, what are you doing? I said, I'm all right. What are you like? He said, I could fit it in there, there, there. We'll come up north, uh, go in your stu the Strawberry Studios. You did the woman album. Uh, We'll do it all, just go for it. <clears throat> and I'll invite Denny, Denny will come up. Uh, and I think it was uh, not Daddy Sywell, I said this the other day. The drummer, Jerry Conway, mm. was the drummer on it. Beautiful man, great drummer. Uh, and we'll just do it. And that's how it was. He came up north uh, uh, and we just went every day 
to Strawberry Stewart. I used to take Sarnies, a little drink, uh, etc. And we'd just go in and work there all day. Uh, sometimes me at one end of the studio, or kid at the other end. And it was just magic. It was just a bit Adam McGough McGear, but with our kid as the producer this time with real stuff and lovely people coming in. Mainly the guts of it was him, Denny, Lynn, uh, Jimmy McCulloch mm -hmm. uh, uh, and those beautiful drums. And uh, that we just came, it, it flowed into this McGear album, which I, I became very fond of and very proud of. It was uh, a marvelous, in the end, a, a great album. And it came out, and <laughs> it's a great story. The cover in England, it was a gate sleeve. Yes, yes. For those who don't know what a gate sleeve is, a gate sleeve is a, a, an album that opens up. Unfortunately, Americans could not have a gate sleeve. They were only given one sleeve. They weren't allowed to open it. So there it is on the front <laughs> is me. I had this idea of being like Gulliver's Travels, and I don't know why. So maybe it was in scaffold, whatever it is, and so I'm lying down, all tied up, and then you open the gate sleeve, and I burst out of my chains, and all oh, very symbolic, and I am s sitting on in Liverpool on the banks of the Mersey, yes, yes. and the more I look like. Uh, Brian Ferry from Roxy Music, the better. <laughs> <laughs> I want all that bullshit, all those touching up like Elvis, yeah. they used to touch up. I want all that. <laughs> and so the best bit was coming down to London for, this, for, the, for the cover of, and that cover that you see on the album cover, there's me stretched out on mm. the thing, and all the little people, the Lilliputian people, including my mum and dad, and our kid, and Lynn on horses, my children, etc. all the people, little people uh, around uh, there. But that's me uh, lying down uh, as Gulliver on the thingy, and it looks real because it was real. I came down to London, and this photographer said, look, Mike, I don't want to... I don't think they had Photoshop those days no. anyway. <laughs> so it's got to be look good. It's got to be. But I've got to tie you with all these things, with the actual string across it. I've got to do it. But let's uh, go to the pub first. I said, well, we can do that now. Before the pub, let's do it. No, no, no I've, I've, I've planned it all. It's all ready. Let's go to the pub. So we get the pub, and he's drinking pints of uh, pitter. I think, gee, this is going to be a great session. But he's a pro. So it came, but he was drunk. So we get back to the studio, and I have to lie on that board, <laughs> right? And then he's doing these strings all over me and banging them in, literally banging them in. So when he's getting to this part, you'll see it on the thing. <laughs> he's getting to these, uh, this interesting part of my anatomy, and he's tying the strings and banging them. Whoa! <laughs> oh, I've got to be hairy. I must admit, oh, dear. And slow down, son. And so uh, that was the real. That was the real cover on that. I had no idea. I thought that was a, the, the strings were put in afterwards. Oh or no! no. Oh, I was <laughs> literally yeah. tied yeah. down. Couldn't move. You can just imagine if you got that bit and then yeah. gone home. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so you mentioned Brian Ferry, of course. You did a Brian Ferry cover on that album. It's our kid's yeah. idea. He loved the track, and. Uh, it was uh, one of, actually, Brian loved me doing it. It was uh, Sea Breezes, yes. it's called. And he was so chuffed that I'd covered it. And he, he wrote me things and rang and said, oh, that, that's a lovely version. He loved the version. So that was a, a nice thing. It's just one of those magic little albums. Again, it's, a like, it's like uh, you get the uh, original ideas from uh, albums like Pepper and albums like that, that go uh, up and down, in and out, and uh, weave. And, uh, and so I've always liked light and shade in, in my life. Uh, and so the McGear album, I wanted to have that thing of uh, slow and faster, faster, etc., up and down. Again, the roller coaster of an album this time. So that's why it goes up and down and uh, the, the, the casket and things like that and uh, uh, you know, Rainbow Lady and 
all, all these things. That lovely one at the end, the man who found God mm. on the moon. And, and in fact, the other side, it, it ends the first side, have you got problems? There's a great bit at the end, if you listen to the end of, have you got problems, where we're all jamming along. And uh, Brian Jones, Brian Saxophone Jones from The Undertakers, Great sax player, always was, still is, great sax player. Listen to the end of, of You've Got Problems, and there's a great bit. Uh, Jonesy's uh, doing the sax thing as it fades right into the distance. Listen to the very end when it says, You've got problems, what are your problems? Little you problem. You've got problems, what are your problems? You've got problems. And he's doing, doing the sax And right at the very end, just turn it up. And you will hear our kid and Linda go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we kept that in, and so we kept lots of things like that in yeah. that were were there on that man who found God on the moon. Uh, came out of certain things like a journey I I did f driving home from London uh, to Liverpool and uh, motoring along, and there's balloons going. All those things actually happened right. in yeah. the song. They actually happen. I mean, it all happened the same thing. It's just very weird. Sunset, the balloon floating out, and, I, and then that, all this little girl, this Harry Krishna girl, I was in somewhere like Ireland uh, in reception. And uh, I just, whatever I'm doing, reading, uh, down here it was. And uh, this little girl, lovely little innocent girl, poked her head round the thing with the uh, little uh, uh, flowers on her, in her hair. She's a Krishna kid, uh, uh, she, of the Krishna faith. And just an ordinary kid, an ordinary uh, little girl, uh, in this little dress, but she, and she was selling God, she was selling Krishna. And so this little uh, girl called Krishna was actually the uh, all part of it. And then the man, man that found God is all based on reality. The man that found God on the moon was Buzz Aldrin. He'd gone up the, to the moon, got down there, what the hell am I doing up here? Unless it's all a giant set, mm. and they never set off. Of course. <laughs> but he got up there. He's having delusions of grandeur if he didn't. And got up there and <laughs> looked down at the earth from the moon and was, whoa something bigger than all this and he got god on the moon mm -hmm. and that's what it, the man who found god on the moon that's him no, it's so. a great track and it's a great album and mike we could talk you. for hours but unfortunately time's against us now excuse me pal i've got to but get my train back to liverpool get a train back to liverpool but yeah i really do <laughs> mike thank you so much for your time and thanks for talking to us i'm sorry you couldn't get a word in <laughs> <That's all right. laughs>